أبدأ بسم الله مستعينا رض به مدبرا معينا والحمد لله كما هدانا إلى سبيل الحق واجتبانا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين باب قال الشيخ رحمه الله باب من الشرك لبس الحلقة من من الشرك لبس الحلقة والخيط ونحوهما لرفع البلاء أو دفعه وقول الله تعالى قل فرأيتم ما تدعون من دون الله إن أرادني الله بضر هل هن كاشفات ضر الآية The Sheikh may Allah mercy on him mentions in chapter 7 of the book to wear a ring, twine, or anything similar to them for prevention or lifting of harm or affliction is an act of shirk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his book, Say, tell me then the things that you invoke besides Allah. If Allah intended some harm for me, could they remove his harm? Or if he, Allah, intended some mercy for me, could they withhold his mercy? Say, sufficient for me is Allah, in him those who trust, and I, the believers, must put their trust. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. I welcome my noble brothers and sisters to our lesson on Kitab al-Tawheed, the book of Monotheism. And we're on chapter number seven. And this is a very important chapter just like all the previous chapters that we have taken. And the Shaykh Rahimahullah, in this chapter he speaks about those who wear a ring or anything like it, seeking protection from not being afflicted by anything. And my noble brothers and sisters, this over here will break down into two categories. The one who does this will break down into two categories. Number one is Shirk al-Akbar major shirk and this is if a person believes what they are wearing will protect them from evil they don't hold this to be as a means as a sabab rather they believe what they are wearing itself will protect them from evil so if they're wearing a ring or anything other than it and they believe that this over here will protect them from evil will protect them from harm then this is major shirk shirk al-akbar the second one is shirk al aswar And this is if the person takes this as a sabab, means takes this as a means. They're taking this as a means, then this is shirk al aswar the minor shirk. And we have to keep in mind this means that they're taking is not a means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated. What I mean by means and a sabab, for example, my noble brothers and sisters, when we wake up there is adhkar, remembrance that we say. When we go to sleep, there is adhkar, remembrance that we say. When we go to the bathroom, there is adhkar, remembrance that we say. All of these means over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He made these means for us to seek protection from Him from any evil. These are legislated means. What you say in the morning when you wake up, what you say when you go to sleep, what you say when you eat, what you say when you go to the bathroom, what you say when you get out of the bathroom. But this individual over here, they're taking this thing that they're wearing, for example, a ring in their hand, as a means. As a means. This is shirk al asr This is minor shirk. But if they are taking what they're wearing and they believe that it will protect them from harm, if they're wearing a ring and they believe this specific ring that they have in their finger is going to protect them from harm itself, this is shirk al-akbar. Everybody's with me? Alhamdulillah. Tayyib, means and sabab, al-asbab, means, taking stuff as means, breaks down into three. Naam, everybody's ready? Number one is sahih, correct. Put sahih and then I'm going to explain what sahih is. And sahih, correct, is if one believes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made these legislated means. For example, the means that you say when you wake up, 
the suburb that you say when you wake up, the adkar that you say, or when you go to sleep, or when you eat, and so on. This is correct. Correct, legislated, means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made for us. Everybody's with me? Great. Number two is shirk al asghar And this is if someone holds something to be as a means, a sabab, but they do not hold that this over here benefits them itself. Meaning they do not hold this ring that they're wearing itself benefits them. They just hold it as a means to be protected. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not make this a means. Allah did not legislate this to be a means. This is minor shirk. That makes sense? Which one? The second one is if someone takes something as a means, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not legislate it to be a mean, but they hold that this over here does not itself protect them from harms, but they're just taking it as a sabab, as a means to be protected. Make sense? And yeah. Taib. The third one is shirk al akbar. And this is if the individual believes what they are wearing protects them from all evil. What they are wearing itself, the specific ring that they are wearing, is what protects them from evil. Everybody's with me? Taib. The relevance of this ayah, this ayah that the Shaykh brought in this chapter, the relevance of this ayah is that this ayah is a proof that we should stay away from all sorts of shirk and any kind or any act of shirk such as wearing a ring or a string and so on. Why? Because they do not protect us from harm. Everybody's with me? They do not protect us from harm. Benefits from this ayah. Number one, it is an obligation for the Muslim to rely and depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Muslim puts their trust on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning, my noble brothers and sisters, even with the legislated means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, we take those means, but we leave our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is difference. This is the difference between the mu'min, the taqi, the believer who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the one who doesn't. The one who doesn't, they will take all their active means and they will say, what's going on? How comes my dua has not been accepted? What's going on? What's going on? But the one who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most and who has knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be the ones who take those means, who will tie their camel and they will be patient and put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second benefit of this over here is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands His Prophet to ask the polytheist if their idols can benefit or harm them. And this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing them that their idols cannot protect them from anything or harm them. And my noble brothers and sisters, in the past, in uh, the past, the Quraysh, they used to take idols made out of dates as their lord. Idols made out of dates. And when they would travel and they would be hungry, what did they used to do? They used to start eating from it. They used to start eating from it. So clearly what they're eating from cannot protect them from harm and cannot benefit them with any khayr, any good. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can protect one from harm and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can benefit one with good. And we see this in the Qur'an and in the qissas of the Anbiya as well too, in the stories of the Prophets and the Messengers, Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he was with his people and his people left and he was there and he destroyed all the idols except one, except one. And they came back and they said, what happened to all the idols, O Ibrahim? And he pointed at that one and he said, the big one destroyed it. The scholars say Ibrahim was trying to show his people that this big idol and all these idols that they worship cannot benefit them and cannot protect them from harm and cannot give them any good. <laughs>
أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم رأى رجلا في يده حلقة من الصفر فقال ما هذه قال من الواهنة قال انزعها فإنها لا تزيلك إلا وهنا فإنك لو مت وهي عليك ما أفلحت أبدا رواه أحمد بسند لا بأس به The Shaykh, may Allah have mercy on him, mentions he was remarried from Imran ibn Hussain radiallahu anh that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once saw a man with a brass ring on his hand and asked him, what is this? The man replied, to overcome the weakness of old age. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, remove it for you can only add to your weakness. Should death overtake you while you're wearing it, you would never succeed. This hadith was narrated by Ahmed and a good chain of narrators. A companion who narrated this hadith over here, his name was Imran ibn Hussein ibn Ubaid ibn Khalaf. Imran ibn Hussein ibn Ubaid ibn Khalaf. Him and his father were both companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Radiallahu anhuma. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with both of them. Imran, he embraced Islam in the battle of Khaybar. And he died in the year 52 after the hijrah of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in Basra. In Basra. The relevance of this hadith to this chapter. This hadith proves that wearing rings for the sake of protection from illness or old age or anything other than that is prohibited in this haram. Benefits that can be taken from this hadith. My noble brothers and sisters, the one who commits an act of shirk will not get success in this world and the hereafter. As the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu wasallam told that old man over there. Wearing something for protection of old age or a sickness will not benefit you. It will not benefit you. Number three, benefit number three. Old age will come to all. And there is no hiding from it. Everybody will taste old age who gets to live that time. As long as you get to live, you will get to taste old age. Number three, the Muslim should warn against evil and teach the Muslims who don't know. What do I mean by warn against evil? The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's seen this action over here. And he asked, what is that? And when the individual told him what it was, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he warned against it. Told him, take it off. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam educated him. So one should just not warn without educating. Educating somebody is what will help them stop the action. You should warn or give proofs and evidences and educate the individual. So the benefits we gave is there will be no success for the individual who commits an act of shirk. That individual who does not make tawbah for it will not be successful in this world and the hereafter. Number two, it is haram for an individual to wear a ring or anything else thinking that it will protect them from old age or an illness. Number three, old age will come to all who get to see it. All who get to live at a certain point, old age will come to them. One cannot run away from it and one cannot hide from it. Number Three, the Muslim should warn against evil but at the same time, or number four, but at the same time should educate the people. Warning itself is not enough without educating. Educate them with proofs and evidences. <laughs> ومن تعلق ودعا فلا ودع الله له وفي لفظ من تعلق تميمة فقد أشرك
The Shaykh Mullah Bersan was also recorded by Imam Ahmad in his Musnad in a Marafuah Hadith from Abdullah ibn Amir radiallahu an that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Whoever wears talisman or an amulet would never see his wish fulfilled by Allah, and whoever hangs a seashell would never get peace and rest. And in another, in another version, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, Whoever wears a talisman has committed shirk. Tayyib, the companion who narrated this hadith, his name was Uqba ibn Amir al Juhani. He was a well known companion. And during the time the Khalifa of Muawiyah, Uqba was appointed to be the governor of Egypt. During the Khalifa of Muawiyah, he was appointed to be the governor of Egypt. And he was the governor of Egypt for three years. And he died at the age roughly of 60. The relevance of this hadith over here, it proves the prohibition of attaching amulets or seashells, thinking that they will protect you. This is a proof that that is an act of haram. A benefit that could be taken is that the Muslim refrains from wearing any necklace or any having any seashell thinking that it will protect them. The Muslim, once again, as we said, puts all trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Shaykh, he brought these ayat and this ahadith in this chapter over here, where they all roughly revolve around the same thing. He just did not bring one proof to warn against this. Rather, he brought plenty of proofs. And what does this show us, my noble brothers and sisters? This shows us the importance for us to stay away from it. It shows us the importance for us to stay away from it. أحسن الله إليكم قال الشيخ رحمه الله وعن حذيفة رضي الله عنه أنه رأى رجلا في يده خيط من الحمى فخطعه وتلا قوله تعالى وما يؤمن أكثرهم بالله إلا وهم مشركون رواه ابن أبي حاتم It was reported from ابن أبي حاتم that حذيفة رضي الله عنه saw a man with a piece of twine on his hand as a protection or cure from fever. So he cut the twine and read the verse of Allah. Most of them believe in Allah and still practice shirk. The companion who narrated this, his name was Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman. He was from the earliest of companions to embrace Islam. He died in the year 36 after the hijrah of Mustafa sallallahu alayhi The relevance of this hadith in this chapter is this hadith affirms that wearing a thread to protect yourself from illness is an act of shirk, an act of polytheism. Benefits that can be taken from this hadith over here, it is obligatory for the Muslim to forbid the evil and call to good. It is obligatory for the Muslim to forbid the evil and call to good. My noble brothers and sisters, once you guys have knowledge of something in Islam and you see an individual, a Muslim, your brother or sister is doing something opposite to it, it is obligatory for you to go tell them. It is obligatory for you to go tell them. You cannot say no to each his own, I'm going to leave them. Rather, it's obligatory for you to forbid the evil and call to the good. And call to the good. And this is the level of Iman in faith. If one could stop it with their hands, then they stop it with their hands. If they are not able to stop it with their hands, then they say something with their tongue. If they are not able to say something with their tongue due to a difficult situation, then the least they could do is hate it with their heart. The least they could do is hate it with their heart. A benefit from this hadith over here is the ayah that Hudayfa radiallahu anhu mentioned. And this ayah over here, my noble brothers and sisters, as the Mufassirun say, this ayah proves that the polytheists, the mushrikun of the Arabs at that time, all believed in Tawheed al rububiyyah They all believed in the oneness of Allah. They all believed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that 
gives life and causes death. They all believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that provides them their sustenance. They all believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that allows it to rain and allows the sun to come. But the issue in where they went wrong was what? Tawheed al ibadah the Tawheed of worship. Singling out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all acts of worship. So if one by himself just believes in Tawheed al rububiyyah an individual themselves believes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that gives life and causes death and believe in Allah's Lordship. But they do not believe in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this does not make them a Muslim. One has to believe that Allah's Lordship and one has to believe that all acts are done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the pagan Arabs at that specific time, they believed in the Lordship of Allah. But where they went wrong was the worship of Allah. They associated partners and ascribed rivals to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. في الصحيح عن ابي بشير الانصاري رضي الله عنه انه كان مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في بعض اسفاره فارسل رسولا الا يبقين في رقبه بعير قلاده من وتر او قلاده الا قطعت فشيخنا الله مرسى وزان chapter 8 the chapter of Ruqa, incantation, talismans, and amulets. It was narrated by Abu Bashir al-Ansari that he was in the company of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on one of his journeys. Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent a messenger ordering that there shall not remain any necklace of bull string or any other kind of necklace around the necks of camels except it is cut off. This was narrated by Bukhari and Muslim. طيب. This is chapter number 8 And I have a question for your brothers I have a question Why did the Shaykh, may Allah have mercy on him or Why did he not start this chapter off with acts of shirk That include ruqya and amulets Why did he not start with that? Why is shirk not written in the chapter headlines like the previous chapter? Everyone understands the question first of all? Everyone understands the question? Shaykh, you understand the question? طيب, you see this chapter over here? This chapter over here, it doesn't start with shirk. The previous chapter started off with shirk. How comes this chapter over here does not start off with shirk? Is there a good form of shirk? Is there a good way of talking about it? What do you say? Ahsant. Very good. The reason why the Shaykh, rahimahullah, did not start off with shirk is because ruqya is divided into two. It's divided in what is permissible, a sharia, what is permissible, ruqya that's permissible, and ghayr a sharia, and ruqya that's not permissible. Ruqya is divided into two ruqya that's permissible, and ruqya that's not permissible. Ruqya is uh, if one is sick, if an individual is sick and is inflicted with something, that one reads the Quran. And we'll, we'll get into it and we'll talk about after what makes it be correct and what makes it not be correct. The companion who narrated this hadith, Abu Bashir al-Ansari, and he was a companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He witnessed the battle of Khandaq and he died at the age of 60. The relevance of this hadith in this chapter, this hadith affirms that it is prohibited to put a string or a necklace or anything similar to it on animals and camels, thinking that this over here is going to protect them from evil. Benefits that can be drawn. Attaching amulets or strings or necklaces on animals is haram. It is mandatory to remove evil whenever possible. People must be warned against all forms of shirk, even if it's being done to the animals. Assalamu alaikum. Qala shirk rahimahullah. Wa'ani ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu qal, 
سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول إن الرقى والتمائم والتولة الشرك رواه أحمد وأبو داود The Shaykh may Allah mercy him says It was narrated by Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an that he heard Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was saying Ar-Ruqa, Tabayim, and Tiwala are all acts of shirk. This was narrated by Ahmed and Ibn Abu Dawud. Waqal al-Shaykh rahimahullah wa an Abdillah ibn Arkayn radiallahu an marfu'a man ta'allaqa shay'an wukila ilayhi Rawah Ahmed wa Tirmidhi And the Shaykh may Allah mercy him says it was narrated by Abdullah ibn Hukayim radiallahu an in a, in a marfu' hadith Whoever uses, attaches, or wears a talisman to himself will have that talisman put in charge of him. This was narrated by Ahmed and Tirmidhi. These two hadith over here, they affirm that using any of those three mentioned over there is an act of shirk. Wearing them, holding that they are means to be protected from evil, or believing they themselves protect you from evil, then this is an act of shirk. طيب. A Muslim benefits that can be taken is a Muslim should have knowledge and be alert from all forms of shirk. One should only attach oneself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not any objects. One's heart and soul should attach themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no objects. Protection comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. طيب. Ruqiyah. Ruqiyah has conditions for it to be permissible. Ruqiyah has conditions for it to be permissible. And there are three, my noble brothers and sisters. Number one, أَن تَكُونَ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَسُنَّةِ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ So number one is that it is from the Qur'an or the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. And continuing with number one, or making a supplication using Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's asma, his names, and his sifat, his attributes. So number one is that it has to be from the Qur'an and the sunnah. And also making a supplication using Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes. Number two, that it has to be with speech that is understood, mafhum. That it has to be with speech that is understood. Masmu' that is heard. Ma'loom that is understood. In the Arabic language. So, number two is that it has to be with speech that is mafhum, that is understood. Masmu' that is heard. The individual should be hearing it. Ma'loom that the individual understands it and that it has to be done in the Arabic language. Lugat al Arabiya. Number three, that the individual believes that this is a sabab. It's a means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated and it does not benefit you except with the permission of Allah. Everybody's got that? These conditions over here, if someone brings a new condition, it's not part of these conditions over here, then it is not accepted and it will not be the correct ruqiyah. Ruqiyah is done in the Arabic language. Except in a case if it is a dua, a supplication that one is going to make. If it's a supplication, a dua that one is going to make, like for example, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cure you. This is permissible. You can make supplication and dua in any language. Ruqiyah is something that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu had done on him. Aisha radiallahu anha, she did ruqiyah on the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu And it is also said that Jibreel alayhi salam, he did ruqiyah on the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu So if any of your brothers or sisters need help and they're going through this, you should help them with this over here. The Sahaba, they had faith in Ruqiyah and they took it as a proper means 
for example, the story of the companions who traveled and went to a city. And when they went to that city, they seen a group of people. And they asked the group of people if the people could host them, welcome them. And the people didn't host them and welcome them, so the companions went further away. Then the chief of those people, the leader of those people, he got inflicted. He got inflicted. Then those group of people went to the companions and they said, we need to do ruqiya on him. At the end of the story, the companion went to that man over there and he read Surah Al-Fatiha. He read Surah Al-Fatiha on the man. And the man got cured by the permission of Allah. But the companion, he read Surah Al-Fatiha believing in what the Qur'an contains and believing that the Qur'an is a source of medicine. Believing that the Qur'an is a source of medicine. And the man was cured by the permission of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know the early scholars of Islam, like Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, when they were sick, and he said one time he was in Makkah and he was sick, when they were sick and they could not go to a doctor, they used to do ruqya on themselves. He read Quran on himself. So this is all means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made permissible. This is ruqya as that is permissible. There's other types of ruqya that people do that are not permissible. That are not permissible. And it's very important for the one who is dealing with this over here that they go through the right means and don't go through people who do it the wrong way where they will not do it with the Quran rather they will affect the person even more or they will use a jinn or shayateen to do ruqya all this is not permissible and the Muslim should refrain from this <laughs> شيء يعلق على الأولاد عن العين لكن إذا كان القرآن فرخص فيه بعضهم وبعضهم لم يرخص فيه ويجعلهم من المنهي عن منهم ابن مسعود رضي الله عنه والرقى هي التي تسمى العزائم وخص منه الدليل ما خلى من الشرك فقد رخص فيه رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من العين والحمى والتولى شيء يضعونه يزعمون أنه يحذب المرأة إلى زوجها والرجل إلى امرأته فالشيخ رحمه الله جوز ما تسمين الرقى التمائم التولى التمائم is the act of putting an amulet around the necks of children to save them from, from the effects of evil eye if the amulet contains the verses of the Quran Allah's major attributes, then it is allowed by some and is allowed by some. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh was among those who disapproved of it. Aruqa, also known as al azaim is the act of reciting incantations or charms. Those are allowed in which there is no trace of shirk. The Prophet sallallahu has permitted it in case of being bitten by a poisonous insects or disturbed under the effect of an evil eye. In Astiwala, or bewitchment is something done by those who claim that they can cause a woman to be more beloved by her husband or vice versa. Hey. That was the Shaykh Rahimahullah who was explaining what these three are. And we're going to start off with number one uh, amulets, tama'im. The Shaykh Rahimahullah he spoke briefly about it and he said, how they are haram except in certain cases it is different in for example if it's quran that's written on them if it's quran that's written on those amulets and he said some of them said it's okay and some of them said it's not okay okay my noble brothers and sisters amulets break down into two write this down amulets break down into two number one those that have other than the quran written on it it has other than the Qur'an written on it. Then this over here is shirk. Number two is those that have the Qur'an written on it. 
the ones that have the Quran written on it, this is something that was different in. Some of the people, they will say that the companion Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As عنهما, that he would have kids that he would be teaching. Would have kids that he'd be teaching the Quran. And for the ones that did not memorize the Quran, that he would give them an amulet with the Quran written on it. So they say for this reason over here, if it has a Quran written on it, it is permissible. Ala kulli hal, Shaykh Al-Bani rahimahullah in the hadith says the hadith over there in that part is not correct. It's not correct. There is a mudallis in it, a person who is not truthful in the hadith. Tayyip, that's one over there. That's one point proving that that's wrong. Another way proving that that's wrong, say now that the hadith is correct. That companion, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, he never put it on the kids to protect them from ayn, from the evil eye. The way people put it on to protect them from the evil eye. So say it's correct, the hadith is correct. He only put it on so they could memorize it. Number three. Number three, a point showing that this is wrong over here, is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, who was from the kibar, the older companions, he said this is not permissible. This is not permissible. And there was no other companion who said it's permissible. There is no other companion who said it's permissible. Abdullah bin Mas'ud said it's not permissible was from the head of the companions or the elders of the companions عنه, and there was no other companion who said it was permissible. So this over here is something that is known as al-ijma' al-ijma' the consensus. As our Shaykh Shaykh Sulaiman Ruhayli Hafidullah says, this proves over here that this is an ijma' consensus because there was no other companion coming and saying, no, this is wrong. Point number five, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never, number one, did this, number two, told his companions to do it. So the correct view on wearing an amulet that has the Qur'an written on it is that it's haram. Number one is shirk. Number two, the one with the Qur'an on it is haram. The one that does not have the Qur'an on it is shirk. The one that has the Qur'an on it is haram. And to continue talking about number two, this is a belittlement of the Qur'an and a disrespect to the Qur'an. Why? Because say now you put it on a child. A child could get dirty. A child at times is not thinking properly. A child could go in and out of the bathroom while they are wearing the Qur'an. So this is a disrespect to the Qur'an. And my noble brothers and sisters, it's very important that the Muslims refrain away from this. Sometimes you see Muslims, they'll have a child and they will give them this and this tamatin and tell the child to wear it, thinking that this is going to protect the child from all sorts of evil. But wallahi, when you open it up and you look at it, you see some of the filthiest things written on it. Shirkiyat written on it. Sometimes you just see scribble written on it, stuff that doesn't make any sense. So the Muslim, they need to put all their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who blessed them with that child, is the one who will protect that child. Protection comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. طيب, ruqiya, we spoke about ruqiya. Now, the one that goes to a magician or goes any other way to get their spouse, their husband, or vice versa, their wife to love them, then this is completely wrong. Because the means that the person is going to take this is from the means of the shayateen. It's the means of the devils. And for the person to go do this, to get this done, they have to do a lot of filthy things. A lot of filthy things. They'll be told, if you want this to happen, you have to urinate in the Qur'an, on the Qur'an. If you want this to happen, 
you have to take the Quran in the bathroom and rip it up, and so on. So the Muslim should refrain from all of this and put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is better than making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What is better than supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There is nothing better than that. As we know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He, every day, He descends to the lowest heaven at the third part of the night. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Who from my slaves are awake? Who from my slaves are awake making dua? So if the abd, if the slave, wants pure protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they should take the right means for it. Supplicating and making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly at the right times when they have to make to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ways that their dua could be accepted facing the qibla lifting your hands up making sure what you're wearing is halal making sure what you're drinking is halal and so on take all the proper means for Allah to accept your supplication and put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala أحسن الله إليكم قال الشيخ رحمه الله وروى الإمام أحمد عن رفيع رضي الله عنه قال قال لي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا رفيع لعل الحياة ستطول بك فأخبر الناس أن من عقد لحيته أو تقلد وترى أو استنجى برجيع دابة أو عظم فإن محمد بريء منه وعن سعيد بن جبير قال من قطع تميمة من إنسان كان ك كان كعدل رقبه رواه وكيع وله عن إبراهيم قال كانوا يكرهون التمائم كلها من القرآن وغير القرآن. The Sheikh may Allah mercifully mentions it was narrated by Ahmed رحمه الله from رويفة رضي الله عن who said that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, Ya Ruwayfi'ah, O Ruwayfi'ah, it may be that you will live a longer time after me. So inform people that whoever ties a knot in his beard, places any string or cord around the neck as a charm, or cleans himself after using the toilet with animal dung or bone, then Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has disowned him, and he has nothing to do with him. And it was narrated from Sa'id ibn Jubayr, may Allah have mercy on him, that he said, whoever cut an amulet or a talisman from anyone, it would be equal to liberating a slave. And it was narrated from Waqiyah, may Allah have mercy on him, who mentions that it was recorded from Ibrahim al Makari, may Allah have mercy on him, that they used to do, dislike every type of amulets, talismans, whether they contained the verses from the Quran or anything else. Allahu Akbar. Khayyib. The first hadith that we've seen over here, benefits that can be taken from it, is this hadith over here is a proof of the prophethood of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why? Because the companion that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was speaking to, he lived a long life. He lived a long life. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you may live a long life. This is a proof of the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The companion lived a long life and he died in the year 56 after the hijrah of the Prophet Muhammad So this was a long time, he lived a long life. Number two, the Muslim should inform those who are ignorant amongst them what is permissible and what is not permissible. Number three, the one should not cleanse themselves with animal dung and with bones. Why? Because the bones, they are from the food of the jinn. The jinn, they eat bones, they eat bones. So one should not cleanse themselves with those two. The next hadith is also a very beneficial hadith. It's also a very beneficial hadith. When they, when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was saying that the one who gets their amulet ripped off them, it's as if they have freed a slave. The one who rips it off them, it's as if they have freed a slave. And the scholars say the reason why it's like that is because it's as if you have freed somebody from a satanic way. 
a satanic evil way. What they're wearing protects them from harm and benefits them from good. By ripping this off of them, it's you are freeing from them from that satanic type of way. Also another benefit from the hadith was the statement of Ibrahim al-Nakhari, rahimahullah, when he said that they disliked what? What do they dislike? All types of amulets. The ones that had Quran and the ones that did not have the Quran. So this shows you that the tabi'een as well too, they disliked it. It's also a proof. Who did they learn from? They learned from the companions, the Sahaba. And they disliked it. So the Muslim should refrain from all types of amulets. And this chapter over here, just like all the other chapters, is a very important chapter. And it shows us Muslims that we should put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times of difficulties. Because generally the one that's going to take these paths over here is one that's going through a problem. And when people are not educated and they are going through a harm, they will go through every single means, every single means, whether right or wrong, to get rid of the harm. They will pay anything, anything. So it's very important that a Muslim has knowledge. As the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said, طالب العلم فريدة على كل مسلم Seeking knowledge is obligatory upon every single Muslim. That doesn't mean that every Muslim becomes a scholar, but every Muslim should know what is permissible for them and what is not permissible for them. So the Muslim should know the permissible ways to get rid of harms if they are going through difficulties. For example, if someone's inflicted with jinn, they should know the permissible ways to go through it. They should go to a trustable raqiyah, a trustable person who could read the Quran upon them. Someone who's known for the sunnah, someone who's known to follow the way of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Someone who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And somebody who is trustworthy. Somebody who is trustworthy. وَهَذَا وَصَلَى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمْ عَلَى نَبِيْنَا مُحَمَّدْ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ أَجْمَعِينَ